Hello, everybody. Welcome. I hope uh, you can hear me. So welcome, 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 everybody, to our first uh, webinar organized by the Degrowth and Environmental Justice Summer School. I am Carlo. I will be the facilitator um, today. Let me introduce myself briefly. I am from Italy and I am a current student at the Master of Political Ecology, Environmental Justice and Degrowth in uh, Barcelona. So just to introduce the summer school briefly before we dive into the topics of uh, today. So um, this year, the Degrowth and Environmental Justice Summer School is formed by two sister projects. Uh, the summer school in Barcelona and in Candecreich. And the first part is traditionally taking place in Barcelona, where students explore, debate, and collectively work on degrowth and environmental justice approaches. And for the second week instead, students relocate to Candecreich in France, in Cerbet, uh, to fully experience degrowth in a rural area. And currently, we are planning the eighth edition of the summer school starting on June 21st, and hopefully it will be presential. So, and also, hopefully, we will post the call by the end of February. So stay tuned for that. And so this is our first webinar of the summer school and um, a little bit of history of our webinars. In 2020, the summer school introduced online webinars, also in collaboration with the UK summer school, Degrowth Talks. And it was also a big success and getting lots of positive feedbacks from students and speakers. Um, for this reason, the organizing team of the eighth edition of the, this summer school is going to present its uh, new online webinar series that is called Degrowth Dialogues. So today we are happy to present our very first webinar, Introduction to Degrowth. This uh, webinar series we run up until June when the summer school will take place, as we said, in Barcelona and Cerber. And uh, the Degrowth Dialogues team will be creating around six webinars in total, one online seminar every three weeks on topics related to uh, degrowth and environmental justice. We will talk about ecofeminism, critiques of technological fixes to climate change, migration and neocolonial narratives, coloniality, degrowth policy proposal and more. So stay tuned also for the next ones. So today I have uh, with me three amazing speakers, uh, Marula Zakari, Susan Paulson and Corina Dengler that uh, joined us to discuss why and how degrowth is a promising path forward given the climate change emergency and ever increasing economic inequalities, as well as uh, a common ground with um, the colonial feminist and social justice uh, struggles. So I will introduce uh, the first speaker uh, that will be Marula Zagari. Uh, she is a researcher and environmental professional from Athens, Greece. She is a PhD candidate at the University of Barcelona, Department of Economics. Her work focuses uh, primarily on energy communities, energy self-sufficiency, energy democracy, and degrowth in Southern Europe. Marula holds a Master of Science in Environmental Science Policy and Management from Central European University and the University of Lund and a Bachelor in Biology from the National and Capuchin University of Athens. And she will do a short intro on degrowth, meaning what it is, what it advocates for, and some of the strategies. Uh, so thank you, Marula. I will leave uh, the ground to you. Thanks. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks for the invitation and for this nice event that you organized. I'm looking forward also to the summer school. Uh, so yeah, I'm really happy to be here and to make a brief introduction on degrowth. Uh, I hope you can see this picture that I, yeah, that Hannah is sharing right now. Uh, well, I chose to start with a picture uh, from John Brungel. He's not very famous. Actually, this picture you can find it in Prado Museum in Spain. 
Uh, and I chose it, the, the title of the picture is Abundance and the Four Elements. So we can see in the picture the personification of abundance, holding the horn of plenty in her hands. The idea of prosperity is completed by the personification of the four elements in the form of two male figures. Um, we can see the ground beside her and two males in the air. Below the allegorical figures of earth and water are accompanied by different types of secret creatures, fruits, flowers, which they offer to the goddess. These pictorial depictions refers to the inherent equilibrium among the elements. So for centuries, the source, this source of what is called cornucopian abundance was understood to be the natural world, the fertile earth. It was a vivid reminder of humans' connection to other animals and a symbol of ecological interactions based on balance. So by the 15th century, the imaginary of Cornucopia began to reflect the rise of mercantilism, the expansion of trade, the marketplace, and the politics of commerce, which became the early stages of capitalism. So if we can go to the next slide, we see this rise of culture of consumerism and corporate advertising in the 20th century, especially in the United States of America, which brought a literal disembodiment of traditional abundance imaginary. The, Abundance, this idea of abundance remained supernaturally significant, but became totally disconnected from the natural world. Advances in technology mean greater control over the environment, greater yield, and a surplus of product. So the horn of plenty and its rich content of fruits and vegetables now remind to the viewer this idea of a thriving marketplace, a prosperous city, or a big grocery store. In the industrialized world of the 20th century, this idea of abundance as a powerful and miraculous source of limitless abundance reappears as the perfect symbol to promote the growing culture of consumers. Now, this idea of abundance works its magic alone. We don't see this woman holding it anymore. Um, it's just the hand of the maker, this invisible market, which um, drives this production and consumption. So I chose to depart from this to discuss a little bit what is behind this idea of the growth. Thank you, Tatiana, I won't need the slides anymore. Um, that is that we live in a planet that has finite resources and a certain current capacity, and thus cannot sustain endless growth. And is this idea of endless growth of this superabundance that we saw that appeared the last century, of continuous extraction, production, consumption, is this machine of capitalism it's what keeps capitalism alive. Without it, it collapses. And it's again this need for growth that creates a vicious cycle of inequality, frustration, discontent, political crisis. Uh, well, I would say, for example, that 92% of the global emissions that we have today are caused by the rich nations of the North. And yet it has been traditionally the less affluent countries in the global South and the minorities in the communities that have suffered and continues to suffer this bigger breakdown. So here comes degrowth. Uh, it's a word that originates back in the 1972, and it was Andre Gortz, if I'm not mistaken, who examined the relation between growth and capitalism. And he, holds, he was the one who asked the question, is the Earth's balance for which no growth or even degrowth of material production is a necessary condition compatible with the survival of the capitalist system? It took us many years and about 424 peer-reviewed papers published on the, topics, on the topic to be able to say no. And I think it's important, it's important to depart this conversation about the growth on what is, but also what is not the growth. So the most common uh, definition you will find online, I think it's that it's a theory and a movement that advocates for a socially sustainable downscale of production and consumption of environmentally damaging goods in overdeveloped countries. So in the heart of the degrowth movement lies this argument that our economies cannot grow endlessly. Endless growth is an abnormal situation. It's like, as I think Susan says also in her book, it's like the cancer, the cancer cells that keeps it expanding until they kill their host. So this endless growth is totally abnormal and it's an illusion and it's determined to fail. I saw recently someone on Twitter writing, you can't keep blowing up a balloon with the idea that it's never going to pop. And I really liked it because the balloon is about to pop. 
The climate change and the habitat loss that has affected the less affluent countries many years ago is now expected to start affecting more and more the global north. And the only way to prevent this, most scientists agree on that, is to cut down CO2 emissions. So in order to do that, a transition to renewables, although important, is simply not enough if our economy continues to grow. So in reality, we simply have to scale down the energy use. And this doesn't mean just taking shorter hot showers, turning off the lights. It in reality means scaling down unnecessary pr production and consumption. By consuming less, not only less energy is required, but also less nature will be degraded and turned into products. And of course, this will entail reduction in aggregate economic activity as measured by our favorite GDP, given the historically coupling between GDP and emissions. And if this sounds a little bit frightening, oh, we need to string the GDP, it's because we have associated happiness and well-being with false indicators like the GDP. It has been shown that after a certain threshold, after a certain point, higher GDP does not mean more well-being, more welfare, more happiness. Actually, on the contrary, this obsession with the pursuit of growth is what drives inequality, environmental and climate injustices. In reality, good life is not associated with high levels of GDP. And I mean, there are many examples. I will just very briefly refer to the most famous one recently, Costa Rica, right? 80% less GDP per capita than the US, but of course really high in most of the human welfare index. Not to talk about the comparison between Europe and the US. So the growth does not advocate just for less, but for an idea of radical abundance, going back to the very first image I saw, saw you. So this would be a way of life based on modest material and energy needs, but reaching other dimensions, a life of frugal abundance, it is about creating an economy based on sufficiency, on knowing how much is enough to live well, and to discover that sometimes enough is plenty and we can live happily with that. Um, so by, well, this is the science behind degrowth. But for me, the magic of degrowth is that it, it doesn't just stop in advocating for less, but brings forward a new way of living, a utopia. So the same way that capitalism has traditionally taught us how to live, how to dream, what aspirations to, ha to have, what our needs, uh, degrowth also proposes an alternative way of living, a utopia that is a result of various ideas, various aspirations, it's pluralistic, it opens the continuous dialogue and it constantly changes. So I don't think if you ask 10 degrowth or how do, we, do you envision a degrowth world, we're going to give the same answer. I think you will get 10 different answers. And this is because of this fundamental pluralistic vision of degrowth. However, there are some things that most of us agree, some pillars, some main ideas on which a degrowth society uh, can be founded on. So we briefly refer to the expanding of the commons and the decommodifying of public goods in order to ensure people's access to services they need in order to have a good life and without needing extra growth or higher income. Universal healthcare, basic income, free education, access to water and energy are some of the examples. I would also briefly mention uh, less working hours, which will not only reduce the production of unnecessary things, but will also allow people more, more free time, what we all need. Tackle down unnecessary industries, and well, I will leave it up to you to think about what these industries are, but I have so many on my mind. It's just enough to turn on your TV and you'll see a million of those. A focus on care work. Uh, I think that's a very, very important pillar of deep growth because if we think our economy as an iceberg, you have the part of the economy that you see and it's actually measured on GDP. And then you have this whole big iceberg under the water that's the care economy, the reproductive work, which is traditionally done by women and recently by women of minorities or poorest women. So there's this whole like reproductive and care work that we do not measure in our, with our indicators. Um, and recently there is this discussion about the universal care income, which is like if someone is interested in more information, we can discuss later. Also democracy and aftercare in order to ensure freedom 
at collective and individual level. So it's a shift toward more democratic forms of institution, business organization, cooperatives that will dampen the growth imperative and will also reduce the resource use. Of course, sharing among, among people and sufficiency resulting from distributive justice, meaning that everyone today and tomorrow will have enough to satisfy their fundamental needs. So as I said in the beginning, the growth is not just another academic buzzword. It's also a movement that has brought together various overlapping movements and is building strong coalition and alliances. I think Corina will talk a little bit about this, but I can briefly say that alignments can be found with movements of social unrest, decolonization movements, racial justice, LGBTQ movements, anti-aviation, slow tourism, house activists, etc. And let me now just briefly in the end say what is not the growth. I'm sure this will be a question that will come up. So let me very briefly say what is not the growth. Economic recession is not the growth. Austerity is not degrowth. And that's because degrowth is planned, is voluntarily. Degrowth does not advocate for cutting wages, for leaving people homeless, for people and for unemployment, nothing like that. It's about a society built on care, built on people coming together and built on solidarity. Also, degrowth is not primitivism. We do not advocate for people going back into caves. Uh, we actually support that some parts of the economy should grow, but not the economy as a whole, not aggregate growth and not unnecessary growth. And finally, COVID-19 is not degrowth. And yeah, we can say that COVID exposed many of the weaknesses of the current system, of the growth obsessed capitalistic economy, insecurity for many people, the healthcare system that have been crippled by the years of privatization and undervaluation, but we also see authoritarian tendencies. We also see uh, mass surveillance. We see invasive technologies, borders closing. And we're missing this core of degrowth, which is people coming together, working together, creating movements, the right on an assembly, on sharing kitchen or living together. So for these reasons, which do not confuse uh, COVID with degrowth. And I will now give the floor to the next speaker, which I guess can give more, more details. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marula, for your passionate intervention. Um, I'm really enthusiastic every time I hear an introduction to degrowth. It's like I'm hearing it for the first time, and it's so nice because it, it brings such a lot of feelings, and um, it's really powerful. So um, thank you. Thanks a lot. And I want to remind our audience that um, questions are really, really welcomed. So please feel free to write in the chat any comment or a question or whatever you want to write, we will collect them and then we will have a Q&A session in around half an hour after our, um, the next two speakers. So uh, next speaker, speaker is Susan, Susan Paulson. Uh, she is a professor at the Center for Latin American Studies, University of Florida. She is the author of Degrowth, Culture, Power and Change, and also of Degrowth and Feminisms, A Light to Forge Careful Path Beyond Pandemic, and also co-author of The Case for Degrowth. Um, Susan researches the ways in which gender, class, and ethno-racial systems interact with biophysical environments, including bodies and landscapes. Susan has researched and thought in Latin America for 30 years, 15 of those living in South America among low impact communities and participates in feminisms and degrowth alliance. Some aspects of her collaborative learning journey are discussed in Pluriverse Learning Pathway Towards a World of Many Worlds and Susan, Susan's ongoing learning about changing relations between masculinities and environment in Latin American contexts is shared in books written in Spanish and uh, in English. Uh, if you're interested, we will uh, link the books that I have already said in the, in the YouTube chat. And Susan today is going to present degrowth struggles to disentangle from coloniality, racialization, and gender. So Susan, thanks a lot for being here with us and I leave the floor to you now. Great. Thank you, Carlos, Tatiana, and others for the opportunity to talk together about passions we share and Marula for an amazing introduction to degrowth. 
So national and international development policies, projects, and discourses have taken many forms. What they share is a linear conception of history in which societies progress from diverse forms of underdevelopment towards a desired end called developed. If climate crisis has a silver lining, it may be the power to provoke residents of high GDP, high emission countries to question the portrayal of our own societies as developed in the sense of full grown, perfected, complete. United Nations fueled such questions with sustainable development goals expressed in a one 2015 report, growing social divides combined with overuse of resources show that today's high income countries should not serve as role models for the developing world. In terms of sustainability, all countries are now developing countries. So in this new paragraph, excuse me, in this new paradigm, what can we learn from pathways conceived as post-development or alternatives to development? These take many forms, some from which I've learned are agroecology, zapatistas, and buen vivir. In the 1990s, I've been participating in groups in Peru and Bolivia who joined alternatives, seeking alternatives to the green revolution through support for local knowledges, ritualized agroecology practices, and worldviews less dominated by dualism and anthropocentrism. In 1994, the world was shocked to see Zapatista's revolutionary front emerge from indigenous community and culture, perhaps even more surprised to learn that instead of claiming larger share of national power and resources, they actually sought autonomy to forge different futures. And this century, long evolving Andean traditions that foregrounded eco-social well-being have been articulated around the term buen vivir, incorporated in a range of policies, programs, even national constitutions. All of these movements have sparked passionate debate and provoked reaction, sometimes violent reaction from the powers that be. Among several thousand conflicts documented in the Environmental Justice Act, Act Atlas, many involve people living with very low levels of consumption that are organizing to resist initiatives for economic development. Mines, dams, oil wells, factories, plantations, highways designed to traverse the Tipnis Preserve in Bolivia or expand agribusiness in Chiapas. Among these and related movements, resistance against political cultural domination is intertwined with practical strategies for world making. Communicated in Gandhi's message, live simply so others may simply live. In Via Campesina's aim of food sovereignty. And in Yasuni cry, leave the oil in the soil. What does degrowth have to do with these pathways? Degrowth has emerged as a network of movements working to forge healthier futures by equitably decreasing global use of material and energy, by curbing cultural and personal obsessions with growth, and by reorienting values, institutions, worldviews around care and regeneration of human and other life. Two dimensions generate fertile tensions within degrowth conversations. One mentioned above is the effort to consider incommensurable material realities, worldviews, practices, positioned in the North and the South. Another is interaction of methods and ideas from natural and social sciences and humanities. Degrowth is based in the science of thermodynamics, ecosystems, and earth systems. It's theorized by Georgesco Rogan in the 70s, popularized by Herman Daly. Societal metabolism transforms material and energy into goods and services in processes that convert low entropy stocks of resources into high entropy race, waste. So degrowth analyzed correlations between these biophysical processes and societal data. How do eco footprints increase in relation to GDPs? How do uneven flows of material and energy across value chains increase profits in some places while increasing entropy in other places? How do global socioeconomic trends correlate with breaches of planetary boundaries? A dimension perhaps even more challenging is decoloniality. Thinkers and activists from Global South have pushed the world to address coloniality and innumerable others are innovating and exercising forms of sovereignty in territories around the world. 
Critics of colonialism and development have long denounced harm done to cultural groups and life-wise labeled underdeveloped. Some, like Bonayuti, even argue that the main factor responsible for poverty and exclusion must be sought precisely where it was claimed the solution was found, in the process of growth and development. Mali's former minister of culture, Aminata Traoré, describes le viol de l'imaginaire, the rape of the imaginary that narrows African horizons of possibility to a white man's dream. It's been more difficult to think critically about harm done along the way to developed lifeways and worldviews like my own. Societies whose political economic domination has occasioned global dissemination of our superior language and lifeways have in the process suffered a cripple, crippling colonization of our own imaginaries. From cartoons, school books, to political speeches, Hollywood films, we've been seduced into complicity with dreams of development that contribute to ethnocentric, ethnocidal, ecocidal outcomes. Degrowth is about seeking paths that I can follow toward broader and healthier global horizons. Since its earliest articulations heighten awareness of their historical positions at the heart of colonizing growth has led Europeans to work on decolonizing their own minds and desires. And to curb ambitions to impose one model of degrowth on differently positioned others. Sensitivity to coloniality is also evidence in insistence that wealthy countries put their own houses in order before intervening to fix the rest of the world on whose backs we grew. Degrowth authors criticize trickle down and charity discourses that make it seem as if growth in wealthy countries helps the global south and instead argue that high income countries would be better to focus on repaying ecological debts, reversing unequal flows of capital and resources. In short, high consumption societies must degrow themselves to allow for increased consumption and especially greater autonomy among the poorest. I'm particularly interested in ways in which colonial expansion has operated through the dissemination of historically specific systems of race class and gender. Industrial capitalism emerged and co-evolved together with colonial racial systems that facilitated access to indigenous land and enslaved labor. Gender was also harnessed to increase productivity and profit as expectations of masculinity shifted towards performance of long hours of paid labor and femininities towards unpaid work, reproducing socialized labor, laborers, and regenerating capacities of people to labor through providing clothing, food, emotional care. These systems are widely critiqued for engineering hierarchy, exploitation, and exclusion. How can we reorient them around care and regeneration of life, adapt them to support greater equity and autonomy? One step we can take is mutual learning and alliance building among movements towards decolonization, deracialization, depatriarchization, and degrowth. Insofar as all these D movements are about resisting the imposition of certain universal models, their partner pluriverse is about honoring existing diversity and nourishing what Zapatistas call a world where many worlds can thrive. The paradigm of pluriverse conceptualized as a rainbow of knowledges, cosmologies, vital worlds, broadens horizons for learning and supporting different visions. Throughout human history, plural knowledges and social cultural systems have been absolutely integral to sustaining the world's biological diversity. That is why your openness to mutual learning in this summer school is so vital to more equitable and resilient worlds. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Really, thank you, Susan, for your amazing intervention. Um, sorry, I got also a little bit emotional because I think <laughs> decolonization of imaginaries and uh, also, um, yeah, uh, deconstruct uh, something that we have inside can be such a sometimes painful and difficult, but also such a liberating and rewarding process. And um, yeah, so. Uh, Thank you. Um, 
So I, I want to remind also the audience uh, again that we are still collecting questions and we will have our Q&A session in around uh, 15 minutes or so after our third speaker, that is Corina Dengler. Uh, hi, Corina. So um, Corina Dengler is a feminist, ecological economist and degrowth scholar activist based in Bremen. She studied economics, development studies, and social ecological economics and policy in Vienna, Moscow, and Quito. She is currently working as research assistant at the University of Vecta, where she finished her PhD in economics at the Chair for Feminist Economics in August 2020. Her research focuses on ecological economics, degrowth, and environmental justice, feminist economics, care, migration, and gender justice, the political economy of resource extractivism in Latin America, and philosophy of science with a focus on critical realism and a feminist decolonial standpoint epistemology. Um, today, Corina is going to talk about alliances, strategies, and future directions for degrowth. So I leave the floor to you. Thanks, Corina, to be here with us today. Yeah, hello everybody and thanks a lot Carlo for your really nice um, introduction. I'm very happy to be part of this introduction to degrowth session. Um, the Barcelona summer school is actually also the place where like, I don't know, six or seven years ago, I started to emerge myself more in the degrowth um, community. So it's really nice to be back here. And I first of all want to thank Marula and Susan for they're really um, thoughtful and inspiring interventions, which like I think some things are just basically similar to what I was going to say and I might shorten it a bit here and there, um, but I really, really thank you. So yeah, um, the organizers asked me to elaborate a bit more on alliances, struggles and future directions for degrowth. So I want to start with the alliances and I want to start with um, some basic premises on why I think those alliances are so important. So at the moment we're living through a multidimensional crisis really. So in degrowth, obviously we have the focus on the climate or more broadly the ecological crisis, but we're also, we're living through a pandemic. We he keep having economic crises, crises of democracy, of care, of migration, of wars, of militarization. So many scholars agree that this multiple multidimensional crisis is rooted in a very specific anthropocentric, monocultural, growth-oriented and patriarchal civilizational pattern and also like in this whole capitalist growth paradigms that basically um, embraces all of those um, specificities. And this civilizational pattern, it also shapes a lot the way in which we're framing problems in which we're seeking solutions, for example, to the climate crisis, namely mostly technocratic, mostly Western science-based and mostly top-down. So as we have heard from um, Susan and Marula, degrowth is different, right? It seeks for bottom-up or bottom-linked solutions. Um, and it's clear for us that a multidimensional crisis surely requires multidimensional strategies. And I'll come back to the strategies later. But what's important, and I think Susan has already mentioned this also, is that for this multidimensional crisis, we simultaneously need to challenge the different pillars of and power relations inherent in this civilizational pattern namely class relation, patriarchy, coloniality and racism, as well as destructive societal relations with nature. So I guess the point I want to make with regard to alliances is that acknowledging that we are living in a multiple crisis and that we cannot just single out the destructive societal relations with nature and the climate crisis, I think this is central and the core message for degrowth and for other climate justice discourses in general. So we can obviously focus on the ecological crisis and our political fights because sometimes I mean one has to focus focus on a part of the struggle but on the other hand we must not forget that all those crises are heavily interlinked 
And therefore, our degrowth also needs to embrace or for the very least be aware of feminism, of decoloniality, of anti-racism, and if you ask me also, anti-capitalism. So some of you may know this cartoon. I was thinking like for a 15 minutes intervention, I wouldn't bring slides, but now I should have brought this cartoon. So some of you might know it. Um, so there's a small wave, um, which is COVID, and then there's a bigger wave, which is a uh, economic recession and since there's the biggest wave which is the climate crisis and there are people standing in the front like in a city like having protest banners for gay marriage and for um, reparations for slavery and all those people like they are washed away by this big biodiversity collapse. So now I obviously understand what people want to say Climate crisis is urgent, or as Greta Thunberg said, like our house is on fire. But if you ask me, like singling out the climate crisis, it's also very, very dangerous because even so, the arguments that we must act now or we should have actually best acted the day before yesterday, obviously, in order to solve the ecological crisis, that's obviously a legitimate argument. Meant, but it still carries the danger of dismissing other struggles as side contradiction in a very old orthodox Marxist manner that has been heavily criticized by Marxist feminists. So I think what I want to say with regard to alliances is this allyship is so important. We can focus on so, uh, socio-ecological transformation, but we need to be good allies to social movements like Black Lives Matter, like to feminist mobilizations like Ni Una Menos or Vivas Nos Queremos. And we need to acknowledge that all over the world there are Black, Indigenous and people of color on the front lines of struggles against environmental destructions. So I think as degrowth scholars and activists, it's really crucial for building those alliances in a very self-reflexive mode also, which does not curtail our agency against systemic injustices, but makes us good allies. So let me continue um, with strategies for the degrowth movement. I think the most important message I want to get across is already, it lies already in the words um, strategies as it is in plural. So as a broad inter and transdisciplinary call for environmental and social justice, degrowth obviously feeds from a plurality of approaches and strategies that shares a common goal of creating human well-being within planetary boundaries. And um, I think in a time of a repolitization of the ecological crisis, as we have it like nowadays with Fridays for Futures, I think has um, had a large part in this repolitization over the last two years. So I think degrowth as an academic discourse and social movement envisions a transformation towards um, the socially just and environmentally sound system. So let's say this is kind of the big vision, but we also need um, those concrete and small steps um, to move towards this horizon. So I think that's a big difference between a sudden rupture, like let's say a revolution and a transformation. So that for a transformation, we also crucially depend on the small steps. But then on the other hand, obviously small steps, like for example, a policy reforms that allows for shorter hours spent in wage work, like um, Marula also mentioned, it's not enough if we don't venture beyond so small steps on our um, utopian horizon. The same goes for lift alternatives. That's a margin of capitalism. It can be considered a small step in the sense that it already built those futures that we envision in the here and now. But due to systemic constraints, it cannot scale out or scale up. So what we need really for a socio-ecological transformation to succeed is strategies that embrace both the small steps and the utopian horizon. So we need a utopian horizon that ventures beyond the status quo and creates systemic alternatives. And I think the concept of um, revolutionary realpolitik by Rosa Luxemburg, radical reformism by Joachim Hirsch, or the concrete utopia by Ernst Bloch is really useful to talk about strategies in a degrowth sense that have both like the small steps and this bigger vision. 
So last year in um, Vienna, so there was actually in May, so degrowth Vienna 2020 strategies for socio-ecological transformation conference. This is big focus on strategies. It was a digital conference, so you can find um, a lot of it on YouTube if you're interested. And in the conference, the organizers heavily drew on Eric Olin Wright's logics of um, transformation and strategies. So he distinguishes three strategic approaches. One he's calling interstitial, one he's calling symbiotic, and one he's calling ruptural. So when I said before that small steps could be like concrete policy um, proposals or lift alternatives, we could say that the concrete policies are symbiotic in the terms of Eric Olin Wright. As I stay within the current institutional framework and the main actor is, for example, a government and acting a working time reduction. The so lift alternatives, on the other hand, are interstitial as they put into practice also so different logics already kind of in the cracks of the current economic system. And then on, lastly, like we have this ruptural transformation according to Wright, which according to him is not a literal transformation as it would provoke such a revolutionary break um, with the current system rather than transforming in so small steps. So as you can see, Wright can actually help us categorizing and evaluating those strategies within the degrowth movement. Personally, like coming from a feminist tradition, I am more familiar with Nancy Fraser's distinction of affirmative and transformative um, strategies, which is somewhat similar. So for Fraser, affirmative strategies deal with the implications of injustices without challenging root causes, kind of without kind of only challenging the rules of the game, but not the game itself, while transformative um, strategies on the other hand really try to dig to the roots and actually change the game. So if we're looking at some specific um, strategies, I think Marula has already um, mentioned some, like on a policy level, we could see so symbiotic strategies like radical reforms, like we could have a Green New Deal without growth, we could have a reduction of hours spent in wage work, making more time for all kinds of other work, like subsistence work, unpaid care work, community work. Um, we could have universal basic services or any measure really to decouple livelihood security from wage work, which I think is a crucially important policy um, for a more gender just um, and ecologically just future. So regarding interstitial um, strategies, we can have a look at, I don't know, cooperative squads, eco-communities that, for example, recreate and nourish commons. And I actually think that if we're looking at um, civil disobedience, like, for example, so Ende Gelände direct action, like blocking coal plants here in Germany, I think it actually has also something to do with a ruptural strategy. It's only like a short term rupture, but still, I think it um, tries to have this um, rupture also inside. So what I'm trying to say basically is that, as I said in the beginning, it's a multidimensional crisis. There are multidimension, we need multidimensional strategies, a plurality of strategies, but we always need to be careful not to be co-opted in a way and not to lose this utopian horizon in the small steps we're taking towards this um, bigger transformation. Um, I think I'm, close to being over time. And I want to um, finish with some really brief reflections on future directions of degrowth scholarship and activism. And I think as I have previously said, degrowth should align with all kinds of other transformative scholarship, also like post-colonial feminisms and the like, and also with social movements. So Martinez Allier and colleagues have argued that degrowth is activism-led science, and um, Ulrich Demmer and Agatha Hummel have called it a field of activist research. And I think we have had climate camps or also summer schools like this one here in Barcelona, where you visit Can Maste or where you go to Can de Grish. Um, it's crucially important to uphold, embrace, and even strengthen this engaged scholarship or what Paul Rutledge has called um, a third space of critical engagement between science and activism. 
So I think there's um, plenty of work to do, actually, at this whole intersection of the different pillars of and power relations um, of the civilizational patterns. I described before, like, um, I think things we have to ask ourselves always is like, how can we connect those struggles for climate justice even more to those struggles that challenge, for example, class relations, patriarchy, and um, coloniality and racism? And how do we create a degrowth scholarship and activism that is truly intersectional? I think I'm going to leave it at this. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Corina, for your beautiful intervention. I have to say that the first week in Barcelona will be actually focused on alliances um, for degrowth, so it will be focused specifically on decoloniality and feminism. So just to point that out. Um, thank you uh, to all the three of you. It's been amazing. And then now we have our Q&A um, session. Um, we're still collecting questions, so feel free to write them if you want on the chat. And um, so I'm gonna read uh, the first one. Um, Susan, if you want to answer, I think this is for you. Um, it says, aligned with your insights, is it correct to state that most of the Western world is not a good example in terms of growth and wasteful consumption? Yeah, that, that's the point. Well said, whoever wrote that. Um, I mean, in the short term, it's clear just in technical terms, all the countries in the world can't consume the same amount of water petroleum, wood, everything that wealthy countries do, and they can't make the same amount of waste. We will blow up like the balloon that keeps getting blown. Um, but I think there's something deeper and more complex about that. I don't think it's good that any way of life becomes the model for everyone on earth. I don't want everyone to be hunter-gatherers, like an a, a tribe in, in Borneo. I don't want everyone to be slash and burn farmers like in, um, in Guatemala. I, I think having really different life ways that coexist is the way forward. And so there's two problems. One is that sort of industrial fossil fuel capitalism is particularly harmful. And the second, that's really a different problem is that that particular model has been spread around the world rather than just leaving it to coexist as one of a thousand life ways. So that's. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I also want to say that I'm addressing questions to one of the speakers, but if any, any, anyone else wants to jump in, feel free to, to do that. Um, Second question uh, addressed to Corina. Um, it says, how can degrowth respond to the Malthusian concerns about there being a maximum carrying capacity for our planet in terms of population coming from not so degrowth people who are critical of growth? Yeah, the population question that it always it's always coming up. Um, well, I think first of all, um, there's a lot of evidence really that Malthus was wrong. I think Georgos Kallus has um, been writing a really good book about this lately, why Malthus was wrong and we all should care, I think it's called. Um, so I think we just shouldn't align with those arguments at all because um, we there's so much evidence that the problem is distribution and not population. So the problem is if 99% of the world owe basically nothing and there's a big global elite. Um, that's, so the problem is distribution of populations. That's what I basically want to say. And most arguments um, align, like align with neo Malthusianism, are really just structurally racist because, like, they don't um, seek solutions for, or they don't 
problematize the high emitting countries where um, I don't know, say have a birth rate of maybe 1.5 per um, per people, but say actually um, problematize people like living in the global south where birth rates may be higher, but still like the emitting, the total emittances are much, much lower. So it's, I think it's really like talking about um, the climate crisis, overpopulation is really not a thing we should align with. No. Thank you, Corina. Um, I would like to address the next question uh, to you, Marula. And uh, it says how can or has the degrowth academia slash movement influence social policies? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, first of all, I think it has started to influence policies and we, we see it all around the world. Maybe it's not always labeled as degrowth, but we see some policies that are influenced from degrowth. So for example, we see the donut economics now in Amsterdam, uh, here in Barcelona, where I live, we have Barcelona and Comú, which is like a platform that um, of co-governance of their seat of the city, and they have also their own energy uh, company by, owned by the municipality that provides clean energy to public buildings. Uh, we have uh, many countries that are now thinking of abolishing GDP as the main indicator. Uh, we see universal basic income in Finland. So you know there there are some. We see universal care income also in Hawaii recently, it's been a discussion. So yeah, we can see that degrowth is influencing uh, policies. Nobody has already adapted, oh, this is a degrowth package because I honestly don't think there's a degrowth package. But I think with small seeds like this, we can start scaling up the initiatives and we can see more and more, especially now with the crisis that we're living, all these challenges can be translated into opportunities. And all these policies that are putting in place, we can see they're becoming like an umbrella and they're expanding, it's like a cascade. So yeah, I think the growth already influences policies and I think we're going to see more and more in these, like the, the upcoming years and after the COVID crisis. I'm hopeful. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, Corina, I would like to ask the next question to you since you spoke about uh, strategies also in your intervention and the question is, does degrowth take a one foot in the system and one foot out approach advocating for policies while also building alternatives? Is one more important than the other or is this a both end situation? How can people on the ground actually ensure degrowth in those communities where it is feasible and necessary? Maybe, yeah, there are more questions, but. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a very nice question, I think. And I think it does. I think it's really, as I said, multidimensional um, strategies we're um, pursuing. If you ask me, which one is more important? I think I, I couldn't say. I would say lift alternatives, but on a small scale. I don't mean lift alternatives in the sense of eco-communities that just do their own thing, but I really mean in, for example, transforming the everyday care work we need to do to collective care work. So those so kind of, because the thing about lift alternatives is also that in the current economic system, living an alternative more often, like often as a privilege, like for example, if you're looking into common in child care initiatives, it's very cool and it should be like this in a degrowth way, but people who have time to come in child care and not send their children like to, I don't know, not send their children to um, public childcare, often have more times than others that are, for example, disadvantaged um, in the sense of class. So I think we should really focus on those small actions also that transforms the way we're interacting with, with each other. And that's why I also think that policies are important because policies can allow us to do this if there's um, shorter wage work and like shorter um, 
time spent in wage work for everybody, it would really allow for people to engage in those other activities rather than it being like an elite project. So I think both is important. I cannot really, so it's definitely not an either or, so it's both and, and I couldn't say which one is more important. Thank you, Karina. Um, Susan, uh, go, go, go. Do you want to say something? I just wanted to add one more dimension to the one foot in, one foot out. Um, in degrowth, as everyone has mentioned, there's really different positions and understandings involved. And some of the people have one foot in, in the sense that they're publishing important scientific articles in mainstream journals, and they've got big jobs in universities. Some people are basically almost homeless, organizing alternative movements in the street. In this wonderful book, Degrowth Movements, explore that. Um, it's so crucial and really, really hard to keep holding hands with each other across that difference because the power is really great. And the danger, sure, the danger is maybe the activists in the street are hungry and have insecurity, but there's also danger that the people, the foot that's in the system gets, gets too connected to the system, right? And so that holding hands with each other and, and keeping each other real and alive, it, it's hard and it's right, right at the heart of where we're going. Thank you. Thank you for jumping in, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, I would like you to answer maybe the next question, if you'd like. It says, since you were speaking a little bit about them before, maybe you can just go a little bit deeper, because the question says, what would you consider as seeds or examples of degrowth? I mean, I think I really love the image of rhizomes, of sort of, um, there's this organic image of the way mushrooms work, that they make all these kind of connections underground and nourishment passes around. And then occasionally, if it rains or an opportunity comes, mushrooms flourish above the ground, right? Um, so it's not so much like one tree, one seed is planted and it grows into a tree, but there's all these kind of mutual connections and networks. And I think people, I think Corina and Marula actually can speak more strongly to some of the important things that are emerging from those rhizomes. One is this collection of small movements that are inspired in, in degrowth movements network. And another is all the amazing actual pretty powerful political economic moves that Marula mentioned. You know, the prime minister of, of New Zealand saying, screw GDP, we're gonna look at well-being." EU parliament saying, let's have a meeting about degrowth. And so I think in a way, in, yeah, I, I like the idea of imagining that our little interstitial work and our symbiotic work is sort of building these underground networks of, of, of holding hands across difference and circulating ideas and, and outrage and also hope um, that then it, it, it nurtures emergence of all kinds of things. And I think probably a lot of things that we can't even imagine today are going to be emerging already tomorrow. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to um, the next question to be open to anybody who wants to jump in. Um, it says, are you aware of any studies investigating the social feasibility slash acceptance of degrowth by the general population and slash or ways to increase it? Nice question, huh? Who wants to jump in? I am not, I don't know about any study investigating specifically the public acceptance of degrowth. I don't know if you, Susan Corina, know something, but what I do know is that it's gaining a lot of attention recently. So, I mean, we see 
articles on the growth published on mainstream media. We saw it on The Guardian. We can see it in The New Yorker recently. We had a big a, a growth open letter that was signed from by more than 2,000 people. We had the first documentary on the growth that actually has been a lot of success, where they also grow the thing it's called. Uh, we had public figures like Greta or Carol Arquette speaking about degrowth. So I think more and more people are engaging with degrowth. I don't know if they agree. I don't know if they agree with everything. And I think it's really difficult to measure that in reality. But I think there's a lot of public support for certain of the degrowth policies. And that's why they're becoming more and more popular. I don't know if Corinne and Susan have any more information on that. OK. Thank you. Thank you for answering, Marula. Um, so next question, uh, Corina, if you want to answer, it says, what do you think of the current potential for social movements that can strengthen degrowth ideas and practices related to urban spaces and body politics in the frame of COVID-19? Um, yeah, well, that's a good question. Also, it's certainly a difficult one because um, obviously uh, um, social movements are also, it's, it's hard to have political organizing and social movements keep them going during the pandemic as much as it was before. I think for me, the pandemic was really, um, it really opened or it really made obvious something which as feminist economists, we've been claiming for years and years, it has made it obvious to everyone, namely that like the wealth and well-being of the world really rests on this foundation of care work, of social reproduction. So I think that's one of the things where I really see a lot of potential um, to transform like together with um, FADA, with the Feminisms and Degrowth Alliance, where also Susan participates. We've written a statement last March, like on feminist degrowth, how like collaborative FADA reflections on um, a careful transformation. So how can we actually, instead of going back to normal versus normal also was really a big problem from a degrowth point of view or from a climate and feminist point of view. Like how can we actually venture beyond and create those alternatives? And I think so a COVID-19 frame re-articulated a lot that um, however we're finding this new normal, it has to rest on the values of care. So that's where I see one big potential. Thank you, Karina. Um, next question is addressed to Susan. Uh, Susan, you said that capitalism became a problem because it imposed itself on other realities. But isn't that innate capitalism and its dependency on expansion? Can we, lay, can we let capitalism exist at all? I wish we got to make that decision. <laughs> Where's the switch? <laughs> um, yeah, people define capitalism as many things. I mean, I look at it as sort of the cultural complex that emerged together with colonialism. And sure, it's about markets, generalized money, commoditizing a lot of stuff. But for me, the heart of it is expansion. Right, you either grow or you get eaten. That's the, the definition. And the way actually to make profit is through unequal exchange. That's the only way you make profit, right? You've got to take more of that person's labor or goods than it's actually going to be worth on the market, and then you make a buck, right? So it's inherently exploitative and inherently expanding. Um, how to not let it happen? I mean, that's a that's a difficult question. And in the US, it gets really confused because many people in the US think only in 20th century terms, like capitalism versus socialism versus communism. Um, and I'm thinking more of like, you know, several hundred years of this, this sort of cultural phenomenon. Um, so there's a lot of thinking and conversation about how to overcome it. And I think strategically, for me, it, it in some ways, rather than saying, I hate capitalism, I want to be done with it, we can maybe just look at those mechanisms, right? 
endless growth is not working in, in thermodynamic terms and in social life terms. So let's stop that part. Um, any, right, exploitative relationships are degrading environments and degrading people's lives. So let's stop that part. And then whatever we have, we'll have to be moving in a different direction. Right? So um, I agree with this person. Yeah, capitalism is the heart of it. I'm thinking strategically, it might be good to actually attack and try to change specific mechanisms rather than throw all of our mud balls at this <laughs> boogeyman called capitalism, which is kind of hard to hit. Thank you, Susan. Um, I would like to um, combine two questions. Uh, maybe Marula, you can, you can answer this. Um, one uh, says, but yeah, I want to combine them because I think they are really related. Um, this question says, uh, do, you, do you not think changing from linear production and consumption to a circular one? And also, do you not think the most important problem of the world is equality and distribution? And I would like to link this with uh, also our last question that says, um, how to share slash awaken the ideas of degrowth in a way that is accessible to all and therefore empower citizens without reinforcing the systemic problems already present and especially with the current pandemic. I thought it could be related one to the other. Yeah, okay. I will uh, refer briefly to the question about circular economy because I think it's very, it's very important, especially now with the new EU circular economy plan. Uh, well, circular economy is a step to the right direction. I mean, nobody says the opposite, but I think it misses some important core principles. I mean, it cannot be a standalone policy. First, because in our current rates of consumption, we, waste will keep increasing beyond our capacity to handle it and, you know, in a sustainable way. And secondly, because it fails to acknowledge struggles of extractivism, oppression, that are offered trespass to third less affluent countries. Uh, which I think brings me a little bit to, to that second part of the question that discussed exactly that, if it's the most, the most important problem is equality and distribution. I mean, I, I cannot choose one most important problem because I think they're all interconnected and deeply interlinked. So yes, equality and distribution is a very, very important issue, but it comes from a history of colonization. It comes, it, it's related with hierarchy, patriarchy, this, beliefs of human that it can dominate the nature and dominate other people and dominate animals, which is all embodied in our current system under the, the label capitalism. So, I mean, I would not choose one more important problem. And I think that's why degrowth is so important because it touches upon many different interconnected issues. And that's what I think we're trying to do, find the deeper roots instead of just choosing one problem and name it as the most important. Circular economy focuses exactly on one area, very important, but it's not just this, the problem. So I think this, the third part of the question was how to share and awaken ideas of degrowth that's accessible to all. Well, make degrowth talks, make degrowth dialogues, be a degrowth ambassador, go be this person that goes to the family tables and says, oh, you know what I read about degrowth the other day, let me tell you what it is. Uh, participating in summer schools, there's a lot of material online that you guys can, can read and people can educate themselves. And this is the first stage. From there, you can write publicly about degrowth. I think a lot of degrowth advocates now we try to make degrowth more accessible to, to the public by writing not only scientific articles, but also writing in mainstream journals, for example, or uh, magazines, etc. You can use the capitalistic platforms of Twitter, and Facebook to spread your views. Uh, and generally, I think, organize yourselves in your communities. Start something, you know, start like an urban garden. Start uh, sharing cooking, sharing like, you know, cook together with your neighbors. Start a care, take some days, you know, organize a caring, share children care activities, something like that. You know, one day I take care of your child, you do the next the other day. Start organizing and give space for different opinion and different ideas. Because I mean, community doesn't only mean, you know, a leading figure organizing everywhere. Come together, discuss, 
open your mind, hear different opinions. I think that's really important. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Marula. Um, Susan and Karina, do you want to jump in for some other advices for degrowth beginners? That I think it's uh, really wonderful also what we're doing now since, I mean, the webinar is, is, is called Introduction to Degrowth, so. I think Marula had already given like such a broad variety of things. I thought it was really good final, final words from my side. I don't have anything to add here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so we do not have questions anymore. Um, so if you want to have a, a conclusion or something, you can jump in uh, right now. Um, what I, I want to, to say, it's just to uh, stay tuned for also our next uh, webinar that will be on March the 9th. And uh, it's called Living Degrowth now and it's based on the example of Kandekrej that is a house of degrowth and we will have his founder Francois Schneider um, with us so it's the 9th of March Tuesday at 6 p.m CET. Um, do you want to add something? I, I just want to say that it's been amazing being here uh, with you uh, I love this panel uh, as an introduction for degrowth <laughs> and I hoped I could participate when I did not know about degrowth. So uh, thank you really for uh, being here with us. Um, thanks also um, to the audience for their amazing questions and their participation in it. Um, also, um, thanks Tati for your technical support uh for making it possible um so yeah stay tuned for also i want to remind you that the call for participation for our summer school this year 2021 will be published hopefully by the end of february so stay tuned also for that and um do you want to add something or should i close it here Okay, so thank you again and see you on the 9th of March for the next webinar. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.